Welcome. Welcome, folks. Thank you. We are um, really glad to um, have everybody. I'm going to quit my mail so that I don't hear all those dings and so forth. Um, and so I wanted to welcome you all and just tell you a, a minute or two about what uh, I um, kind of how this came about. Uh, so I, and about myself, and then I'm gonna let Leonard Van Slyke introduce himself. Um, many of you may already know him. If you don't, he's a great person to get to know, um, especially if you're doing reporting in Mississippi. So I teach journalism here at the University of Mississippi School of Journalism. I was a reporter for quite a few years. We're not gonna count how many um, in Mississippi, uh, weekly newspapers, uh, daily newspapers. I was a reporter in South Carolina, which is not, even though it was a bigger paper at, at Charleston, it's not that different from, South Carolina's not that different from Mississippi in terms of its open um, records and meetings laws and its openness to openness, if you understand what I'm saying. Um, uh, so um, we, uh, so, so I have been sort of in the trenches as a reporter, uh, trying to get information, trying to tell people. I was lucky enough to have always worked for editors who were really committed to this as well and willing to back um, me up at when I'm asking, when I was asking for information, seeking information as a, and even as a, as a teaching journalism, um, I tried to, and, and I also am author of a book, so I used some of the freedom of information laws and open records laws when I was doing some of my research too, just to track down, um, his, it was more history than journalism, but to track down some of the bit of information that I needed. And as the COVID-19 pandemic kind of unfolded, I, along with some of my other journalism colleagues, were just feeling so sort of you know, it was such a scary kind of thing watching this wave start to crest above us and not having access to information and not seeing um, public officials uh, being committed to informing the public like we think they should be. And so I decided to do something about it, which, which was, you know, it makes it so much easier to have a kind of, um, any kind of webinar or q a or conference um with zoom once i taught my classes so i decided to do this so that because i knew that some some younger journalists out there that i might have taught or or the age they may be like i was when i first started really unsure about what should be available and they might and so i thought who better to go to then Leonard Van Slyke, and um, he's a longtime media attorney. He runs the um, hotline for journalists. Well, it's really the the big misconception is that um, open government and open meeting laws are just for the press or just for the television or just for the media. Um, and please excuse me if we have some TV reporters or online reporters, please forgive me if I say press when I mean media. I'm really working on that, but I mean all of you. It's for citizens. It's for everybody. And I used to, sometimes when I was a reporter and trying to get information out of a clerk who wasn't sure about what she could give me and say, oh, we can't give that to the press. And I'd say, well, pretend I'm a, a citizen because I am a citizen and this law applies to citizens too. Um, so, and residents, not just, not just people with legal, I don't mean just legal citizen status, but um, residents. So um, I'm gonna let Leonard introduce himself and talk, tell us a little bit about what he does. And then I'm just gonna kind of walk through some of the most common issues and then I'll open it up for questions. So Leonard, take it away. Okay, Ellen. Uh just uh, very briefly, I, I was a reporter for several years, uh, last couple of years of high school, all of college, all of law school uh, with the Hattiesburg American and the uh, Oxford Eagle. And uh, I then as obviously went, uh, became a lawyer uh, and I have now been practicing law, it will be 50 years in, um, in August. Uh, about 40 of those years, I have been representing the media. 
and and that, as Ellen mentioned, uh, I, I do handle the M Mississippi Center for Freedom Information hotline uh, oh, wow. uh, on public records and open meetings. And so you're free to call uh, at any time uh, and I can uh, hopefully answer your, your question if you, you have a question. Uh, obviously, as a, as a media lawyer, I handle defamation uh, cases as well as access. But access is the topic to, for the day. So uh, let's, uh, we'll move on into the questions. <clears throat> Okay, well, thank you, Leonard. Um, and so one of the things that's come up within the pan with the pandemic, but it's kind of a perennial issue is, um, but especially with, you know, the lockdowns and quarantines and social distancing, is talking about open meetings. And if you could just tell us a little bit, first of all, what the law says about um, how meetings, what, like what meetings should be open to citizens and the uh, press, uh, things like notification and so forth, but just kind of give us an overview of what should, should, it might be easier to say what should be closed than what should be open, um, because <laughs> it might be shorter list, because my understanding is almost, most every bit of the public business should be done in the public. Well, that's correct. That's the, the general rule is that, uh, Every meeting is open unless there's an appropriate reason for executive session. So every meeting begins as an open meeting. Uh, in order to close it, uh, there must be a motion and it must be for a proper reason. Uh, the, those reasons are, are listed in the Mississippi Code. Uh, it's Title 25 dash 41, dash seven, parentheses four, and then A through L. So it, it, there are just a limited number of reasons that uh, the uh, public body can go into executive session. Uh, the most common reasons you will hear are personnel, but uh, personnel and litigation. Uh, but don't just take personnel as being every kind of issue that deals with personnel. It, there's some very, it, the, the exemption is very specific as to what types of personnel matters are exempt and what are not. For example, I have had uh, uh, cases where people tried to say, oh, providing parking for all employees was personnel. No, it's not, not under the law. So you need to really look at the code section. If you have a problem, give me a call and I will uh, help walk you through that. The other one, the litigation uh, exception uh, also is limited to uh, strategy sessions. Uh, that the public body would be having, for example, with its lawyer. Uh, so it, it, it is not sufficient for a, uh, a member of a public body to simply say, we uh, want to go into executive session for litigation. No, they need to tell us much more than that, the court has said. They, they need to tell us what case or uh, that it is, in fact, a strategy session. Yes, sir. Had, Leonard, let me, I'm sorry, let me interrupt you here. I've had um, boards say they're going into executive session for potential litigation, which is so wide, it's just ridiculous. Or um, So they, they need to tell you what case or specific um, issue that they're talking about. It, um, uh, same with um, personnel. I've had them try to talk about giving raises um, right. to broad across the board raises or to departments or um, in uh, executive session and they can't do that. They can talk about, is that, that correct? They can talk about it. That, that is correct. Uh, in the matter of potential litigation, there must have been an actual demand letter or threat uh, that is real, not just 
oh, somebody might sue because we are want to expand our boundaries. It's not, it's not that generic. It has to be specific to some actual demand that someone's made to, uh, to, to sue. Yeah, is that demand letter um, part of open open records? Uh, well, th that is an interesting question. Uh, the uh, now the open meetings law says uh, that public records that are exempt uh, are exempt for open meeting purposes, but it doesn't say the other way around. So. Uh, I suppose that's an open question, but I would uh, I would think so long as a demand letter is uh, just simply that, uh, it should be subject to a public records request. Right, and you can put the one thing that you can do is put the uh, the board attorney on um, the spot and say things like, uh, you know, as an officer of the court, are you? Um, telling me on your honor that, that you actually have a demand letter you know if you're not going to show me the demand letter are you going to tell me on your honor that there is a true and actual um demand letter and you know that's not anything you can go and enforce but it's a way to um you know put them on the spot and try to hold them to account um okay right. so so i'm sorry i may continue to jump in leonard but you go ahead um about open what kind of notifications do they need to give if they're going, especially if they're going to have a special meeting or going okay. to change it? Okay. Well, if a, if a public body meets by statute at a regular time or place and or has uh, established in its meeting uh, minutes that it will meet at a specific time, for example, the second Tuesday of every month, then that's all they have to do. For the regular meeting. In the event of a recessed meeting, a special meeting, or an adjourned meeting, they have to post notice of that meeting within 24 hours of the decision uh, made to hold the meeting. In other words, if we're going to have a special meeting next Monday uh, at one o'clock but we decide to do that today at noon you've got to uh, post that uh, notice within by one o'clock today uh, also uh, if you want to be advised by email you can uh, give written notice to the public body that you want to be advised of any special recess or adjourn meetings or any meetings of the public body uh, and they are required to give you such notes okay great and so they have to post it just on the door of the courthouse or uh, i mean you meant you covered the best practice would be to get on their email list but um right. I'm, i know some of them sometimes just stick it on the door and expect you to wander by well, that was the, the law until a couple of years ago okay. that that's all they had to do is, uh, is post it in the building in the place where they normally hold the meetings. But now uh, there is that list that uh, certainly any member of the media or any interested uh, citizen for that matter uh, can get notice uh, by requesting such notice. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, after the, after, if they go into executive session, um, they have to first take a vote to consider executive session. Sometimes this is confusing. They have to take a vote to consider going into executive session and discuss that if there's any discussion in public, correct? Yes, uh, that's right. There, there's actually a two-step process that they can or really should follow, but, uh, I don't see much point in holding them to the first no, part. Just, sometimes it's confusing <laughs> if they do it. It's kind of confusing to, to reporters, I think. Right. I mean, you they can uh, have a vote to go in to discuss whether or not uh, a, a particular topic would be appropriate for executive session. Then they come back out, and then somebody makes the motion to actually go into executive session 
And that, uh, that vote will have to take place in the public and it will be recorded in the minutes by, uh, by a member. Right. So now once they go into executive session, what can be, uh, so they can't take any official votes in executive session. So say if they, they, they have to come out to do any action, right? Is that correct? No, that, no that's not correct. Okay. Actually, they can vote in executive session. Uh, and they, uh, but they do have to record that vote in right. the minute if they take it. Now, the, the problem we sometimes run into with that procedure is that uh, the minutes don't actually have to be recorded uh, for 30 days. Uh, so uh, they might take an action and not actually get around to doing the minutes or intentionally not do the minutes for uh, till the next meeting. Uh, so that's, that's a problem. Uh, the, the basic reason for that, as I have, it's been expressed to me, primarily relates to uh, personnel matters. And, I, and they say, well, we don't want to fire somebody and that be revealed in a public meeting before we have a chance to tell the person. So that's the rationale, but uh, of course there are many other <laughs> issues that are, uh, can be discussed in executive session that, uh, that uh, really that rationale wouldn't apply. So I would certainly, as a matter of practice, at the end of the meeting, I would certainly ask, uh, although they're not required to announce it. Right. And if you've been working your um, boards behind the scenes, you probably will have one that's willing to tell you, at least off the record, you know, what's going on and, and, and try, trying to see. Um, now, and when they have to record the vote, that means they record who voted for and who voted against, correct? It's not that's, just three to one. That's right. By individual member. It's got to say Paul or Joan Smith and, uh, you know, and, and whoever. And then again, the the names against so yes by individual member they have to record that in the minutes so let's talk about COVID-19 right now and other kinds of states of emergency like hurricanes and so forth what kind of leeway do they have and what should reporters do to um you know kind of counter that or to be ready to to meet with to, to see what they're doing yeah uh well the first, I think the first thing that we need to address is the fact that one of the reasons for executive session appropriate reasons would be an emergency. Uh, so to the extent that there is some real emergency, they, the public hospital ran out of ventilators or whatever, you know, they could meet without uh, and, and go into executive session to have that meeting and probably would get away without notice. Uh, but uh, COVID-19 obviously is a whole special circumstance. Uh, I would say this, that uh, if, if uh, we found out, of course, with the uh, Hattiesburg case, uh, that the Department of Health has to identify the nursing homes. Uh, and so, you, also, I think if uh, with meetings, uh, specific to meetings, the question has come up uh, about, well, what about, uh, they say it's not safe to have the public at a meeting. Uh, I think you, uh, we have to realize that these are special times, but I do think the public body would at least be required to arrange for Zoom uh, so that uh, so that any member of the public could attend their meeting, not just... And I'll just jump in here. I'm also um, happy to be on the board of aldermen of Taylor, a little, tiny little town, um, and I know that when we were trying to have our meetings, we checked with the Ethics Commission, and they're kind of and Mississippi Municipal League, and they were so, sort of like, well, just do the best you can to make sure the public can see what's happening. Um, so uh, FaceTime Live is, I mean, not FaceTime, Facebook Live, 
uh, posting on YouTube. Now, can they have the meeting? Is there any requirement that they have it live so that people can comment or public or can, as long as they record their meeting and post it immediately, is that still okay? Or does it need to be interactive? Well, uh, that, of course, it's hypothetical. We, I, there's not been any ruling on this, but uh, I would, I would think to the extent possible, it ought to be live so that people could see and hear it while it's going on. Yeah. Uh, but having said that, certainly uh, public bodies are going to be given some leeway with these extraordinary circumstances. Right. Great. Okay. Um, the last thing I was going to say is so you're at a meeting, you think they're going into executive session or they're shutting you out or they're meeting. We had a question. Um, uh, from Green County, we that uh, I think I forwarded to you. They're 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 meeting they're meeting all together back in a room and talking about things apparently or maybe or we don't know what they're talking about. Some um, and you're wondering uh, can they do that? When can they get together? What if you feel like you're being shut out of meetings? What's your best best process to? Um, address that. Uh, okay, well, we have some pretty clear law on that. Uh, anytime that a quorum gets together, they could make a decision. So that's a meeting, whether they call it one or not. So uh, three, of, three of five or whatever the, 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 the number is for that board to make a binding decision. That's correct. And there is a specific case out there called City of Jackson, it's Gannett versus City of Jackson, uh, where the uh, City Council of Jackson attempted to meet in what they called a retreat, which they said wasn't a meeting. And uh, the Supreme Court said, yes, it was a meeting. Uh, regardless, if you're talking about uh, everybody trying to get along better, you had an agenda, you had a meeting. Right. Okay. So you're at the meeting. You're a young reporter. This happened to me. My very first meeting I covered, and they they um, went into executive session, and and I didn't think that it was covered. So what do you do? What 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 what's the best thing for a reporter to do when they're getting ready to do that? Okay. I think uh, that you should respectfully stand, and if they vote on a reason that you think is not one of those listed uh, in the uh, Mississippi Code. If you think there is improper, you should stand and say, uh, I don't believe this is appropriate for executive session, and I want that recorded in the minutes. That, that'll be helpful to us later on, should uh, a lawsuit or whatever develop. The other thing you should do um, is, there is a very simple procedure uh, with the Ethics Commission uh, if you go to their website, they have a complaint form for both open meetings and public records. And you should make a complaint and uh, back it up with exactly what happened. Uh, and as, as far as if you can get the minutes, uh, that, that would be good. But in any event, re explain exactly what happened. Then the public body will be contacted by the Ethics Commission given an opportunity to uh, refute uh, what you said, and uh, then the Ethics Commission will decide. So that's a pretty powerful stick. I don't think people realize how powerful because public officials don't want to be called out by the Ethics Commission. Uh, so that's something that I would encourage you to do. Of course, the, the other uh, option is you can go directly to court, but I think uh, normally speaking, you would want to make a complaint to the Ethics Commission. One caveat, uh, the Ethics Commission is a rather small agency, and so the turnaround time and the, the actual commission itself only meets once a month. So the turnaround time on complaints uh, is, is rather slow. So don't expect 
that you're going to get an answer the next few days. And that's, of course, that's a problem with the system because lots of times you want an, you need an answer the next few days, but you're not going to get it with, uh, with the Ethics Commission. But I would still make the complaint because it will help you in the future. Uh, when if, if they are inclined to go into executive session for the wrong reasons, they're not likely to do it if they've already been called out by the Ethics Commission, who has the power to find them and, and do other things. Right. And, you know, you can, um, it's really important to start documenting immediately um, who was for it, who was for it, you know, it, were some of them willing to let you in and some not, you know, because um it becomes so so i've covered meetings where they wouldn't let you in and so this that becomes the story and as journalists we are often taught we don't want to be part of the story but um i had a great editor at the DeSoto times bill bailey who was really great about calling you and interviewing you about you know like so if they were, if they locked us out of a meeting suddenly there'd be a front page story and an editorial or um, and the same with TV, it's like, we're standing outside of this meeting, they've gone into executive session, here's what state law says, um, and officials hate that. So, so you can write about it, either editorial, address it editorially, or just as a, the fact that they are not following, at least based on your analysis, and if you can get someone like Leonard or someone at School of Journalism like Charlie Mitchell um, in our, uh, at, at University of Mississippi, and I'm sure there's some other schools to just talk in general about what, what, what is allowed and what isn't allowed, the readers can see. Um, so that's another option you have is to just report about it. Yeah, and that's a very powerful option. Uh, I, I do want to go back and touch just a minute on something uh, you raised earlier about developing a source on, on uh -huh. the board. Uh, that becomes really important when you're uh, suspicious that the board is going into executive session for the wrong reasons. Uh, really uh, early in uh, the open meetings law, we had a case, Gannett, with the Hines County Board of Supervisors. And what developed was that uh, there were two supervisors who didn't want these uh, rogue executive sessions. They wanted to do it right. Now, they, I don't know if their motives were totally pure or not, but uh, at least they were on the side of transparency. Uh, interestingly enough, one of those was a very conservative Republican who represented uh, Northeast Jackson, and the other one was a liberal Democrat whose name uh, was Benny Thompson. Uh, and they they became the source for uh, for the Clarion Ledger to be able to report on everything that was happening in executive sessions. Uh, they the board got so upset about that that they asked the attorney general for an opinion that they could exclude uh, Benny from the meetings because he would tell everything that happened. And the uh, attorney general said, "No way." Yeah, he's elected. <laughs> I didn't know that story. Uh, so yeah, that uh, that that actually happened back in the early '80s. Uh, uh, yeah, well, that's really great. And um, someone on the chat has said you could also contact Tucker Carrington, who is in charge of the law school clinics, knowledgeable about legal remedies. Another thing, you know. Um, a lot of times folks, and this goes for the open records we're about to get to too, a lot of time the folks that are out there in Mississippi doing these things, they're not lawyers, they're not journalists, they're not up on the records, they're not, they haven't been socialized to talk about complicated, um, touchy, uh, uh, controversial things in public, um, and so they're going to default. And so oftentimes I've found that, you know, if you can just start to explain to them what the law says and start to talk about what could happen if they don't, 
you know, if they, if they break the law. Um, and if you do that kind of ahead of time and let them know that you're really concerned and you're very um, interested in open government and, and that, um, uh, uh, so the, my first boss, he wrote up in Hernando wrote so often <clears throat> at his little weekly paper about, um, you know, with, he just have editorials and write news stories every time they locked him out or he'd call every, so Horn, <coughs> excuse me, Horn Lake and South Haven boards decided to have a secret meeting to discuss merging the two towns into one one town you know which you can imagine is clearly every bit of public business um and it was chaired by the chamber of commerce and he called every single board and at hold them on whether they thought knew they were breaking the law whether they thought this was a good you know whether they supported it or not and then a few years later i was covering a board of supervisors meeting they were talking about trying to go into executive session and one of them finally said you know what, let's just talk about this in public, because if we don't, Bill Bailey will go crazy. Um, <laughs> and I thought, you know, so, so there are lots of different ways to try to, um, you know, sort of carrot and stick uh, to get yourself um, in those meetings. Um, so I'm going to post at the end of this, I have a slide uh, that has a lot of, has the information about the hotline that Leonard runs and some other things. If you'll put your email in the chat, um, I can send that to you as well and, and some other information. Um, but so let's go move on to open records um, and then we'll take some questions. Uh, so let's just talk what is not available first because I think that's a shorter list than everything that is maybe. <laughs> Well, uh, I wish that were true. I, the, basically, the, the public records law, in, in my opinion, has way too many exemptions. And what is the, the real problem is that they're not in one place like the open meetings law. So the public records law, uh, the exemptions are scattered throughout the Mississippi Code. And so it's a lot harder to get a handle on, on those. Uh, but uh, you, you you can certainly uh, make always make a public records request if you're in doubt. Make the request, then it's incumbent upon the public body if they're going to deny your request. They have got to tell you within seven days uh, in writing why what the exemption is that they're relying upon. Now I said seven days, that can be extended to 14 if they contact you in seven days and explain why they can't get the information to you in seven, but in no case can it go any longer than 14 days. So I, I know there was some question about the Department of Corrections that came up. That's the absolute worst public body uh, to deal with in, in Mississippi, in my opinion. Uh, but uh, I think we've got to, somebody's got to stand up and challenge them. You know, you got, you got to go to the ethics commission. They've got to get their uh, hands slapped a few times so they'll start responding uh, within the appropriate time. But anyway, the bottom line is make the request. If, if the public body says that uh, they're denying the request, they got to give you the reason. And then if you don't think the reason is correct, you collect your request, you collect their response, and you make your, uh, make your complaint to the Ethics Commission with those documents. Right, and so what, what kind of costs can they charge you? Because I know that's become an issue with some, some folks in Mississippi, some things in Mississippi recently. It, yes, it is. it's an ongoing problem. Uh, what the statute says is actual cost, meaning what the uh, what they actually incur in cost. The problem gets to be uh, the time spent by an employee to gather the information. Uh, however, uh, the, the the law does say that it's uh, they have to use the lowest priced person that is capable 
of gathering that information. Of course, that gets to be uh, a, a question of fact as to whether some, uh, some clerk is capable of doing that. Uh, sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not. Uh, I would uh, always, if you think the, the cost is high, I would certainly always ask them to break down the cost so you can analyze it. Uh, for instance, we have had situations where they went out and hired the most expensive law firm they could find to review a request, uh, it really just to try to make it go away, uh, saying that no one in their office was capable of making the legal decision as to whether or not these records were exempt. So uh, again, make your request, then if the cost is, it seems excessive, get a breakdown of the cost, and then we can ultimately throw it to the Ethics Commission to decide. I will tell you that the Ethics Commission, as far as copying costs, I think uh, their model rules say 10 cents a page, something of, of that nature. It's supposed to correspond to the actual cost of, of providing information. What about when they're in electronic form? Um... Yeah, uh, again, uh, you can request it in any form that they have available. Now, one thing I, I, you do need to know, and this is a frequent uh, misunderstanding on, on the uh, part of people making requests, you cannot cause a public body to create a record. You, you, in other words, you can't say, give me a, a list of uh, all of the expenses you incurred uh, the last 30 days. Now, if you, if you tell them to give you a copy of the records that contain that information, they have to do that. But they do not have to create a list for you. And so you need to uh, always understand that. Um, and someone in the chat has said, uh, um, in your records request, I have learned that you should also include a request to provide the appropriate records custodian should the entity you sent the request to deny it for lack of access. Yeah, I, and I always, I, I suggest that people send it to the head of the agency and let them worry about who's supposed to respond to it within their agency. Uh, so I, I'd send it to the director of the agency and then that way, we know that person has uh, access to it and could provide it if they wanted to. And again, just like everything, take notes, take note of the date you sent the request, when you got back, if you have any conversations, write down the times and, and who you talked with about it. Um, all of that can be useful when you, if you're trying to seek some kind of redress, just the more you can document your efforts to do it. Uh, and you may, you know, we, um, one paper I worked at, there was a very controversial decision by the, and this is not an open records kind of thing, but it was a controversial decision about by the DA, and he refused to be interviewed or answer any questions about it. And so we documented every single phone call and every email for like 50 something days. And then we finally wrote a story about how many your requests for information on this that he had not responded to. You know, so sometimes that becomes a, that becomes a story. And he was furious, but he did give an interview after that. So, um, so you know, make it, documenting your efforts can be helpful. And always submit the initial request in writing. You may right. have some later telephone conversations, but always submit that initial request in writing so you do have the document that shows you did that on such and such a day. Yes, and in the links that I'm gonna put you, I'm gonna have one to the Mississippi Center for Freedom of Information, and it's got all the statutes and so forth, and so you can even cite those particular, you know, it is my understanding that these are open records and I request under this such and such, and I request that, those kinds of things. Um, okay, so let's just talk a minute about the kinds of things that can be, um, available for um, reporters that could be useful under Mississippi law, just some of the most common kinds of um, open records. Well, I, I would just, I think the, the first thing to note is 
I would assume everything is open until I am uh, and advise otherwise. Uh, I mean, there are some things you know, you know, that it would be foolish to ask for, like uh, the personnel record uh, you know, of an employee. You're not going to get uh, that. That is obviously uh, protected. But that uh, that one, uh, the personnel record, is the only one that says it shall not be provided to you. The other things are actually discretionary. They, they can use the exemption if they wish to, but they don't have to. Right, right. And I've, well, I've covered different police, and I'm about to get to the police. I've, never, I've covered some places that under the Mississippi, under Mississippi law, the police chief is happy to give you the you know r report or something like that or, or or another official in 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 one agency and then you go to another county and they don't um so yeah so they do have some discretion um in in that uh and um sometimes they don't even realize that themselves they'll just they take the easiest path of least resistance um let me ask you this about personnel so laws come up with all the issues about um, law enforcement and questions about brutality and racism and those kinds of things. Obviously, the individual personnel record of a police officer is not available, um, but what kinds of disciplinary, like, if, if, um, can you ask for how many officers have faced disciplinary um, without the names, or what kinds of things could you could you get to get a picture of that? Well, again, uh, you know, the, it's uh, it's a matter of of whether or not they are willing to do it. You you can't have them create a list of how many, but you can if you have if they have information that meets your request that, that is contained in a record, they can always redact information that you're not entitled to. The, the problem you're generally going to run into with those types of things is they will invoke what's called the investigative uh, exemption. And that is, uh, there's a, a big hassle about that and what's investigative and what's not. When does it stop being investigative or does it? I've had an attorney general uh, argue with me uh, 20 years or so ago that uh, once an investigative record, always an investigative record. Doesn't matter uh, they, if they don't indict or it doesn't matter if they convict. Uh, an investigative record retains that character. I, I don't believe that should be the law, but, but very frankly, there's not a case that says it one way or the other. What right. you're always entitled to is an incident report. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a pretty pretty bland document, uh, but it uh, sometimes, uh, particularly in small towns, uh, they don't create a separate incident report. So you might get uh, a full report with redactions uh, if you ask for that. You're always entitled to that incident report, which is basically uh, who's involved, what the charge was, and where it occurred, and if there was any property what uh, stolen or whatever, what that was. What about the jail docket? Can you talk about that? Because I know sometimes you can track down what's happened by going to the jail docket. Actually, access to the jail docket preceded the uh, Public Records Act. So, yes, you, you are entitled to that. Um, so, so you could go over to the jail at any time and say, I want to see the docket of who's been arrested and who's been, and what, and, and what all is going to be on that for them, tell them. Yeah, it, who it's, who's, who's there. I, I, I suppose, I don't know that there is a spe specific format for a jail docket, but obviously the names of the people that are there are going to be. Yeah, right. And usually, <laughs> well, the ones I've seen, at least here in Oxford, have the names. Uh, it's been a little while. Uh, the arrest, uh, the, what they're like, the charge that they're there, um, and when they were brought in, at least, I think is. Um, yeah, I think that would be pretty common format. 
Um, and, and so, so, so if the police aren't going to give you the incident report, but you know that they've arrested somebody, you might be able to find out some information at the, um, yeah, and you're up, you're clearly entitled to the incident report. That's right in the statute. So right. the if you if they refuse to give you that, uh, that's uh, appealable to the uh, ethics commission. Okay, great. Um, okay, well, um, why don't we? I know there's more that we could talk about um, uh, about. FARPA and, and privacy of students and so forth in schools and universities and also law enforcement. But I want to use our time wisely. So why don't we open it up to any questions? If y'all want to just put them in, uh, or just go ahead and let's see, how do we, you, you can go down to the bottom and raise your hand. Does everybody know how to do that? Uh, let's see. Okay. Yeah. So, um, as somebody with a finger up, <laughs> oh, that's Deb Winger. She knows how to do that. Okay, I see. There's a little hand. So, um, so go ahead, Nancy Dupont, if you want to go ahead and answer. I don't know if I need to do anything on my end. Um, She's got to unmute. <laughs> uh, yeah, unmute, uh, Nancy. I don't have a question. Oh, okay. You you just raised your hand so I could see how to do it. <laughs> okay. Does somebody else have a question? Um, uh, let's see. Um, Sarah says on the jail docket, you can also see which attorney. That's a very good point. If any is representing, and that is that is true on all the ones I've looked at, representing the, the detainee. Now, if they're going to have a public defender or they don't have an attorney yet, it might not be there. Um, does... Uh, um, so do material, one person writes, um, section 40, 2541.53 provides that materials will be distributed to members of the public body shall be made available to the public at the time of the meeting. Um, did those materials include a monthly email routinely sent by the executive to his board before each scheduled meeting that presents and discusses items on like the packet? I think is that, you know, before our, our alderman meeting, we get a packet every week of material, I mean, month of materials. Yeah, I, I think it, the intent there is that it uh, include materials that are going to be discussed uh, in that meeting. And uh, that would be the, the packet that uh, all of the aldermen uh, receive. Right, and they could remove, if they had a packet about a specific employee or a lawsuit, they could remove that. But everything else, rezoning information or um, mayor's report about some proposal or something like, all of that should be a public record. Yes. Part of what they include to you. Um, so I don't see any, I'm not seeing a, any hand raises right now. Um, Somebody says, I missed this. What are the data sets we should be thinking about accessing this fall as schools go back in session? That's a great, um, that's a great question. And, and I, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. What, what is it that they want uh, to I was just say, what are the data sets? So like if they have, um, and Deb, if you want to add some more, um, uh, the, um, data set of um what, what are you thinking De deb and specifically what should we think about accessing this fall as schools go back in session what does she say uh it said, oh, you i need to unmute her she can't let me unmute yeah. everybody yeah um, right yeah do that. uh because i'm sorry i'm obviously not a, a zoom um uh, well, okay. I think it, you did it. Okay. Um, my husband would love to have this feature. I know, but, uh, in terms of the question, um, you know, I, I, it seems like it's always difficult to get rapid reports from school systems and or universities. You know, they, uh, is there a way I mean, I'm sure they're going to have to be tracking 
what the COVID-19 situation is within the public schools, within the universities broken down by school and university or by district. Um, you know, what could we be doing now to prepare to get that information? Well, I, it's, I think first, first thing is obviously anything that uh, exists as a record you're entitled to. Uh, I would think that uh, that's not otherwise exempt. Uh, I would think that they would be making plans now for how they were going to reopen. Uh, for example, are they going to go uh, have two different sessions, a morning and an afternoon session with different students? Are they going to discontinue virtual learning or, or what their plan would be? I, I would think that within the next uh, 15 days or so, they're going to have to make a decision on that. So I, I would certainly think those records were, would be important. Right. And what they are be pulling, like what, what, what have they compiled to make those decisions? And I think Deb is saying like, so if they're monitoring number of infections, how do we, we don't have to know the student or the employee or the teacher or professor's name, but if we've got X amount, can we get to how many infections do we have at the local elementary school or how many infections do we have in the school district reported? If, if there's a document, a, a writing that contains that information, you would certainly be entitled to it. Including email. So we've got, we've rerun into this here um, at the university. Uh, so emails, um, talk about how email, com, um, com, what, what emails are available and, and those kinds of things. Um, well, public record. well uh, I'll have to, to compliment uh, Robbie Ward on that one. Robbie is no longer in Mississippi, but he, when he was with the Tupelo newspaper, asked for the emails I, I believe it was the mayor and it was declined but the ethics commission ruled that any email uh, that's created by a public official uh, is uh, a public business uh, it's it's available so uh, that's one thing that public officials and uh, Ellen I would think it, you as a public employee, that's something they certainly need to be aware of. That if, if they're making an email, that, that might show up somewhere. Right. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, one public official, uh, and I'll, I'll choose not to say who it was, but uh, it, it, it was learned that he was having an affair from a general email request. It just wanted all of the emails of that public official for uh, say like a week period or two week period, something of that nature. Right, so, so if you wanted to find out how say the state health department and the governor were discussed, like the, the Dr. Dobbs and the governor, if you want to find out what they were discussing in February and March about closures and, and what kind of warnings they were getting, you could absolutely request those, correct? Yeah, you could, if, if, they, if they put it in emails uh, or they put it in any other document for that matter, uh, you know, uh, you, you're, you have access to it. Um, there's also some, uh, you know, I had a former student at the Sun Herald who did a really great story on travel authorizations and the State Department of Transportation and and won a bunch of investigative reporting awards, Michael Newsom, for doing that. And, and one of the things that he found is that once he reported on that, people started coming out of the woodwork sending him um, documents and, and things or telling him where to look for more stories. So that's one. Um, uh, uh, so that's another um, uh, thing to be thinking about. Uh, so reports, you know, oftentimes school districts will do reports on drug and alcohol use among their student body or there's all kinds of um, documents and pu things that uh, public bodies prepare uh, that can be great sources of stories that are open records. Um, uh, now, uh, so the university often hides behind um, privacy and FERPA for uh, students. And so what are they in school districts as well? What are they legitimately under the law 
can they withhold and what 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 are they what do they need to be given us well uh, that's a really good question it's uh, and, and I, I can't give you a really great answer to it but it's still an open issue but uh, I will say we have been able to get some records involving uh, athletic departments uh, and disciplinary proceedings, uh, not individual names, of course. Uh, right. But, and, and clearly we're not entitled to the academic record of the student. I think that's what FERPA was intended to protect, but, but the problem is that uh, what you will hear from schools, universities in particular, is they could stand to lose all of their funding if they uh, give you a record that, uh, that the Department of Education later decides was not appropriate. So they just take the, the uh, easy way out and say, no, you can't have it because of purpose. So right. uh, it, it, you're going to have a tough time uh, with the university on that issue. Uh, also, right. Universities are notorious for hiding uh, donor records. Yeah, uh, and uh, I, you know, I think that those should be available. What they will claim with those, uh, they will claim that the foundation is a private corporation, right. and uh, other states. In, in some other states, it has been decided that. If that, if the overall body, the university, would have to, uh, would have to do that function, uh, but for this uh, private entity, that that should be considered a public body for the purposes of records. Uh, but uh, I can guarantee you, if you send a request today to the University of Mississippi Foundation, you will be denied, right. and as as well as the athletic. Has anybody taken that to court? Not in Mississippi. Uh, that and that, you know, I, I, I longed for <laughs> somebody right. to. Uh, but it, you know, it's it now it is very uh, unusual for uh, newspapers to to go to court, and they're about the only ones that ever will. Uh, yeah. We uh, when. Back uh, a few years ago, uh, it was very common. We, yeah. Would, uh, but now with the financial issues, uh, it's it's tough. Uh, well, I think you know, and one thing I would want to encourage the folks on here is to think about joint filing. You know, if you've got other, even a lot of times I've been. There's not that many places, unfortunately, the day, these days where there's more than one reporter from more than one entity covering something unless it's uh you know jackson or one of the cities in a lot of these counties you might be the only one but um you know i competed against a lot of reporters but as soon as they started encroaching on open records or open meetings we you know we stood shoulder to shoulder and so uh you know if somebody is willing to like especially with these health documents or some of the statewide things if you've got maybe if you could share the costs across um uh, multiple news organizations to join it um i would encourage you to do that i worked for a paper in charleston and you know we had a we had an attorney on retainer and lots of your news organizations probably do they need to do something to earn their money. Get them to write a letter for you, if nothing else, or make a phone call. You know, ask your boss if you've got an attorney on a retainer and if they're willing to, because sometimes that'll, that's all it'll take because those other places don't know how far you're willing to go. And when they get a call from an attorney there, um, they'll, they might back up a little bit. Um, uh, is that sound advice? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. I, I have, uh, I've, I've represented the Clarion Ledger for many years, and I've written uh, many of those letters. Right. Years. Well, and I'm a lawyer's daughter, and my brother and uncle and everybody, uh, uh, lawyers all over the place. But um, the first thing they tell me is don't ask your attorney or any attorney, 
can I do this? Ask them, how do I do this? Because their easiest thing to say is no. So whether you're talking to a board attorney about getting documents or open meetings, or if you're talking uh, to your own attorney, say, this is what I want, this is what I need, how do I get it? How can I get it? Um, so anything else that anybody has, please put your emails in the chat. I'm gonna save the chat. Um, and let's see, I see one message. Oh yes, and I'm gonna send your, let me put the slide, share the screen with the slide uh, um, with the information and I'll email it too, but it's just some websites. Where the heck did I, there it is. Um, uh, let's see, um, desktop, uh, no, that's not what I'm, share. Nope, that, uh, yeah, there's something to that yeah, Deb, I don't judge. I do a lot, this a lot better with my classes. I've forgotten how to do it. Uh, Deb's, Deb Winger's on here. She's our dean. And I'm like, don't judge how I'm Zooming by how I'm running this, uh, how I'm teaching by how I'm running this. But here it is. And if you'll put your um, information in the chat, I'll save it and I'll send you some emails. I'm also uh, thinking about doing a couple of other ones of these little sessions about reporting on local government or other special topics. So I may be <clears throat> emailing you for suggestions or polling to see what people would like to see. So, um, uh, but there, right here you've got the Mississippi Center for Freedom of Information. It's mcfoi.org. There's a handbook there that, ha that you can order or download with a lot of these answers, the hotline information. There's a National Freedom of Information Center. Uh, we sent this out to high school journalists too, so if any of y'all are there, the Student Press Law Center is great, or university students, reporters. I love the investigative reporter and editor's website, and they have a new edition of their handbook out. So um, all of those are good, and I will email those to you as well. But thank you all so much. Oh, um, anything else? Let's see. Uh, Thank you all for, for coming and for all the hard work that you do. Thank you so much, Leonard, for um, your great insight and being willing to jump in on this for me. And um, uh, we will, um, hopefully you'll get some calls from your hotline because I want to know more about this whole COVID-19 thing. It, you know, it's, it's very anxiety. I wish people, officials would realize that the more information they give out, the less anxiety and the less problems they have down the road, um, especially in a, an issue with a pandemic like this. And the more transparency, the better. But okay, bye everybody. Thank you so much. Bye. bye. I'm trying to figure out how to save this chat.